And good morning to you all again. Uh, today we are still in the book of 1 Thessalonians. We're going to pick up right where we left off last week. We looked at verses 1 to 8 last week, and today we're going to look at verses 9 to 20. Um, so let's jump right into it today, and then we will talk about it a little bit today. So this is 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 2, verses 9 to 20, and that is on page 959 and 960 in the Pew Bible, if you want to follow along. You remember our labor and toil, brothers and sisters. We worked night and day so that we might not burden any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how pure, upright, and blameless our conduct was toward you believers. As you know, we dealt with each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. We also constantly give thanks to God for this, that when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you, you accepted it not as a human word, but as what it really is, God's word, which is also at work in you, believers. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, for you suffered the same things from your own compatriots as they did from the Jews. You killed both the Lord, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out. They displeased God and opposed everyone by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles, so that they may be saved. Thus, they have constantly been filled up. They have constantly been filling up the measure of their sins. But wrath has overtaken them at last. As for you, brothers and sisters, when for a short time we were made orphans by being separated from you in person, not in heart, we longed with great eagerness to see you face to face. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly, I, Paul, wanted you again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus that is coming? Is it not you? Yes, you are our glory and joy. <clears throat> All right. You might have noticed in there that Paul uses a lot of threes. That's something that Paul uses a lot in his preaching, his teaching. Uh, in this, we have three sets of three in this bit of scripture. He said pure, upright, blameless, talking about himself, talking about how they interacted with the, with the uh, people in Thessalonica. He said that they urged them, encouraged them, and pleaded with them. And finally, he said that they were his hope, joy, and crown. And with that, we'll go back through this a bit by bit. But let's watch for those three sets of three as we go back through here. If you remember last week when we left off, Paul had just likened them to a nurse tenderly caring for, the, for her children. That was the maternal aspect of the relationship, the, 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 the uh, comforting part of the relationship, tenderly caring for them. And now he's going to talk about being a father figure to them. Um, but first he says that they were pure, upright, and blameless in their conduct towards the folks in Thessalonica. Um, pure, they, they didn't have an altered motive. They simply wanted to preach the gospel to them. That was their only goal. They weren't trying to take advantage of them monetarily or for any other reason. They were upright. They were blameless. That part, if you've ever been in a, around a church, that, that, that part it seems a little bit peculiar. But you have to remember, it's in their contact to, together. Certainly people blame Paul for stuff. Certainly people blame us for stuff sometimes. But it's not necessarily something that's right, is it? A lot of times it's a misrepresentation. It's a twisting of what's actually happened. It's maybe even sometimes an outright fal falsehood. It's a lie. Uh, people fabricate things in order to blame them. Because you have to remember, in Thessalonica, Paul wasn't even there for three weeks, as we've said over and over as we've gone through this study, of this series of Thessalonica, or First Thessalonians. Paul was only there for a short time. But he got so much done. And let's go to his conduct toward them. As you know, we dealt with each of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God. Urging. Hopefully with our children, we urge our children to 
to get involved in things, to do things. We encourage them to do things. Now, you're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. And sometimes we have to plead with them. Yeah, you, 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 this is difficult. This is hard. Maybe you messed up. But you can get back in there and you can try harder. You can do this. You can, if you apply yourself, you can get through this. We have to keep doing that. The thing that he doesn't mention necessarily, and the part of that pleading is, to say, he said, well, he does say that, that you lead a life worthy of God. He's pleading that they remember. Sometimes part of that pleading is correcting, is what I wanted to say. Part of that pleading is correcting. That's the thing that people don't like about the Bible. That's the thing that people don't like about hearing the good news, is that you have to admit, if you're going to come to Jesus and ask for forgiveness of your sins, you have to admit that you sinned. And human nature is such that we want to believe that, we, that what we do is all good stuff. And you sometimes hear people that have done horrible things and they have no regret because they don't think that what they did was wrong. If you're truly going to come to Jesus, the first thing you have to realize is that you're a sinner. So we're all sinners. So we've all broken his heart. People don't want to be reminded of that. And we could say that I'm preaching to the choir, but the problem is, or the fact is, I should say, that we all do it. Even though we've all, at some point, hopefully that are here, have devoted our life to Christ, We've all, at some point, done something we shouldn't have done. Whether it's just a momentary thought, or a word, or a deed. We all need forgiveness. We all need to work, as I mentioned earlier, on our relationship. We all need to get out that good book and spend more time in the book and prayer and meditation. We all have something to improve upon. None of us have played a perfect game. We use that analogy towards this a father urging, encouraging, talking to a child, playing a ball game. No matter how good a game they played, at some point, there was something they could have done better. And sometimes, if we could just tell them how great they did and didn't point out where they fell short, they can't correct that part where they fell short, can they? Because they may not have even noticed it. Well, maybe they didn't realize that that was something where they, were, they could do it differently and do better. We also constantly give thanks to God for this, that you receive the word of God that you heard from us, accepting it not as human word, but as what it really is, God's word. The folks in Thessalonica must have really been blessed with perception. God must have given them, given them some special anointing that they latched onto things so quickly. We should pray for that, that insight, that we should grasp the message and understand that it is God's word, that it's not just something that somebody's telling us, that this good book that we have is the good book, that it's God's word to us. Let's hold to that. We need to work at being believers. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus. Seems like during the devotions and even the sermons, we seem to be getting this over and over and over in spades, how we're supposed to imitate Christ. Would almost be like that's something that's important. Wouldn't it, Gary? Yeah. Seems like that must be important. So we, maybe we need to focus on that. Living less like this earthly being that we are, and more like this perfect being we worship, that we follow. We won't get there, you know, I'm not going to try to tell you you're going to get there, but just like that father urging that son to do better, or that daughter to do better, or whatever it is, we need to be, remember that the scripture's doing the same thing, it's urging us to do better, be closer imitators of Christ, and we all have room for improvement, or none of us are playing the perfect game. No one's playing a better game than others, but none of us are playing a perfect game. Now we have to be careful with some of the rest of this, and this is where we get into trouble, where the church gets in trouble. 
So the, oh, excuse me, uh, pick up where we left off in Christ Jesus. That are in Judea, that's the church that's in, in, in Jerusalem. For you suffered the same things from your own compatriots as they did from the Jews. When it says the Jews there, they're not talking about the Jewish people. They're not talking about Israel. They're talking about the leaders in the temple. Talking about the high priest and some of the scribes and some of these things. They would have fear of Jesus upsetting the apple cart and causing trouble with, between them and the Romans and possibly upsetting their financial extreme that they had with the way that they were working things, the way things were working for them, the benefits that they were receiving because of their positions, their power. They were worried about that. This is not a condemnation of the Jewish people. And we have to be careful because people will try to use this. And my God, today, if you turn on the news, anti-Semitism is unbelievable. If you didn't know it was out in the world today, you turn on the television, you watch it and use it all, you're going to see it in spades. I'm just absolutely floored at the level of it that's out there. And it's among people that we know and love, folks. It's a, an incredible danger. Not only for the world, but for those people's souls. They are in very deep, tragic danger of condemnation. We really, really have a problem. We need to spend time in prayer. We need to spend time in conversation. If someone says something to you that sounds like it's anti-Semitic, you need to say, well, wait a minute, well, you know, let's talk about that a minute if we can. And we need to be brave and bold because the scripture tells us that we're supposed to be brave and bold. We're not supposed to keep our light under a basket. I don't preach about the end times because I'm, I'm constantly in the mindset that too many preachers spend, spend their whole focus on the end times. And I've constantly said that if you live today like tomorrow is going to be the last day, you'll be okay. And I think the end times theology is some of the most distorted and misquoted and, mis and abused theology of all. But we are a day closer to the end, folks. Jesus will come again, once more, in judgment. And things are getting crazy. If he came today, there's an awful lot of people, and like I said, even people that we know and love, that are harboring thoughts that are against God, that are against the Jewish people. Yes, in verse 15, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets? The Jewish leadership killed Jesus and some of the prophets because of Bureaucracy, I guess. Would that be a good word, Gary, to call it? The bureaucracy of the priesthood and all of those things. They don't want their world shaken up. And I'll be honest, not to be political, but I see that in the world today. I see those in power not wanting to give up their power and causing all kinds of chaos to try to hold on. And it is getting scary. Over the weekend, there was a huge demonstration out outside the White House. It was a pro-Hamas demonstration. And from the river to the sea, all Palestine shall be free, is their motto. And people cheer that without having any clue what that means. That means that you wipe the Jewish, country, the Jewish people off the map, off the face of the map. They're gone. That makes the Holocaust look like child's play. And again, yes, politics, but if we just stick our heads in the sand and we don't speak out against it in any way, shape, or form, we're complicit. We need to speak out. And it's even within our own denominations. You have people that are, for whatever reason, thinking that they are so woke, to use a word that could get me in trouble, that they're going to speak out for those poor people, 
the hope that these, these Hamas people, the people in Gaza that are so downtrodden. And yes, we pray, pray for the innocent people in Gaza and other places. But the fact still remains, and it's been said by many different Jewish leaders, that if the Jewish, or if the, the, uh, the terrorists, the Hezbollah, God, the, the uh, uh, Hamas, the, uh, the, Palestine, the other Palestinians, what was the group before that? The, uh, Sir Arafat was in charge of I can't, the PLO. The PLO, the PLO. It was been said all the way back, the PLO used to be the one that was the problem. And there were runs before that. It has been said over and over that if they would set down their arms, there would be peace in Israel. If the Israelis put down their arms, there would be no more Israelis. That's the big, big difference, folks. You need to remember that. Somehow, we need to be out inside of God. We need to be in prayer. We need to speak out, as I said, against the slaughter of people in Israel. It goes on. Would you live in a place where there are rockets constantly fired into your country by your neighbor and do nothing about it? You would not. And somehow you turn that around and make that so that the Jews, the Jewish poor nation, the Jewish people are somehow the villains because they try to prevent you from killing them. This is craziness. We live in a time of craziness. It goes up and down this political spectrum, folks. Right is wrong, and wrong is right. We can't sit on our hands. We have to speak out. We have to be on God's side. We have to speak the gospel. We speak love. But just like that parent that sometimes has to correct you, Sometimes you have to speak out and say, no, nope, you're doing the wrong thing. It's a difficult time to be alive. And I hope you all know that. And I don't want to scare you. But it is a difficult time to be alive. It's a time we need God more than ever. And we need more time in prayer. We need more people in church. We need to get our brothers and sisters here. Because... No matter what you think about the end times, we're a day closer. And since we've been here, we were now closer almost than when we started. He's coming sometime. Are you ready? Is your neighbor ready? Are your children ready? Are your grandchildren ready? We're gonna skip down to verse 18. For we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, wanted to again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, joy, or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus that is coming? Is it not you? Yes, you are our glory and joy. I would present to you that what's blocking you from speaking out, what's blocking me, because I don't speak out enough either. I couldn't convict you by that sermon. Is Satan. We don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want to be troublemakers. We don't want to be against the flow. We don't want to do a lot of things. We don't want people to vent their anger on us. Because there's a lot of anger in this world. And it's crazy anger. It's dangerous anger. I was listening to a uh, thing last night. And the government has listed all of these cities, and I don't have a complete list of them, of the cities that they are, they know there are cells in these cities of terrorists. And I didn't tell Gail, but they said the entire state of New York. They didn't list cities in the state of New York, they just said the whole darn state. We need to speak out. But when we do it, don't do it in anger. And that's hard for me because I've got a bad temper. Speak out in love, hope, joy, and blessing. Cl 
Cling to the cross if you must. Pray for the words that you need. But bring as many people to church and to God as you can. Because I don't know how much longer we got. I don't think it's tomorrow, but I don't know. It's getting weird. That's all I can say, and I don't mean to be a downer this Sunday morning, but some Sundays you need to be down. Some Sunday mornings you gotta come, you gotta realize it's time to come to Jesus, people. We need to convince the world that it's time to come to Jesus, because it, it is. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for very much for the blessing you give us, the joy that we have in you. We're getting closer and closer to the most wonderful time of year, Christmas time, when we celebrate your coming into this world. And Lord, it is going to be soon. In just a few more weeks, we're going to begin Advent. I mean, to remember that Advent is about not only the birth of Christ, but the second coming. Lord, we know that you will be here with us someday. We pray that we will be found worthy and judged worthy on that day, and that you'll forgive us when we don't speak out. But let us be bold. Give us the strength. Give us that courage that we need, that courage that can be found only in you. Today we pray this in your glory.